Good evening. My name is Grant Moniger. I am the creative director and co-head of programmer at the American Cinematheque. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Q&A for Radioactive. We have director Marjan Satrapi, uh, the actress Rosamund Pike, and it's moderated by Cara Santa Maria, host of Talk Nerdy. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here moderating this incredible panel all about the film Radioactive. My name is Cara Santa Maria, and I'm here today with Marjan Sartrapi, the director of the film, and Rosamund Pike, the actress who plays Marie Curie. Welcome, ladies. Nice to be here. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for well, inviting me. I am thrilled, thrilled by this film. Um, I have worked as a science communicator for well over a decade. I myself am a scientist and um, I'm always really excited when we can celebrate strong female scientists, especially in popular culture. And what I love, I have to say just right out of the bat is how complex the character is in this film. So I wanted to maybe start a little bit with Marjan. I'm just gonna dive right in and ask, how did you grapple with developing a character who has become a hero in popular culture and in many ways almost a token of women scientists, but also making her fallible, also making her human? Uh, so hello, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. And just to answer to your question, uh, you know, when uh, you make a film about a person who has actually lived, uh, you know, Anyway, I have to cheat a little bit, you know, I have to arrange my, rearrange myself with the reality in order to have a story, but one has to remain faithful to the spirit of this person. So now, you know, I read, I read lots of biography, lots of articles, watched lots of things about Marie Curie, but the way really to get into who she really was, it was the most important was to really read her own words. So I started reading, you know, her diaries and I, I, I read her correspondences. And uh, incredible enough, uh, Rosamond and I, both of us we, we read the same papers, it was the same sentences, the same word. And both of us, we came to the same conclusion is that a woman genius is exactly like a man genius. That means these are, these are difficult people. So when we talk about a man genius, it becomes very normal that they would be difficult because they're geniuses. But when it comes to women, it's always this, uh, you know, everybody is expecting us in a weird way that we have to be very nice and very, you know, welcoming and, you know, apologetic, etc. And that was exactly what she was not. So now, uh, you know, she's a hero in many senses, but she's also a human being and no human being is perfect. So if you want to, we, we want to humanize her, is also to talk about her imperfection. And what I liked the most about her was actually that she was not likable this much, that she was difficult, that she was a little odd, that she was not apologizing, that she had lots of integrity. These are the things that really attract me, not only uh, in people in general, but particularly in, in a woman, these are the, the things that I consider as being like a major, yeah, pluses for this person. So this is the way I approached it. And Rosamond, when you were first approached um, about this role and you started to dig really deep into the human being that is Marie Curie, did you have a similar sensibility? Were you trying to embody a woman who is a little bit unlikable? How did you approach that role? You don't start with thinking, oh, I'm unlikable or she's unlikable. I didn't find her unlikable. I found her completely riveting. I found her forthright and determined and audacious and um, impolite sometimes or abrupt um, um, because it didn't behoove her. She was a busy person with lots of things on her mind and lots of things to get done. And, and I figured that sort of taking too much, you know, being terribly nice and getting everybody to like you, that, that's a terrible time waster for someone with a brain like Marie Curie. I mean, it, it, it really is a colossal waste of time. Um, sort of acquiescence and constant kowtowing to, you know, what do other people think? It, it, it's not going to further the discoveries that she wanted to make. And I think that living a singular life is what gave her freedom, freedom to explore and freedom to make this, 
you know, remarkable discovery. I actually found it charming. <laughs> but then, you know, Marjan and I are similar in that respect. We find, you know, an unfiltered mind that speaks its truth charming. Some people find it hostile. I, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't agree. Uh, I, I can't agree. I can't. I don't agree with that. I can't work out whether I want to say more or less. Um, um, so, I mean, I I fell in love with her. I thought she was remarkable and funny, and amu she amused me, frankly. And I have to say, also, I fell in love with her. How modern her thinking was. This gender role that she refused to assume throughout her life. That was. Um, expected of her, that she, her womanhood and her femininity was her own. She didn't reject womanhood or fem femininity at all. She owned it, but she also refused to play the, the role of a subservient wife, the role of a less than thinker. And um, what an inspiration, I think, for many young women watching a film to say, I could be that. She was that, you know, however long ago. A hundred years ago, she was that, and now I could be that as well. Well, obviously, obviously, because you know, Marie Curie, it's quite incredible, you know, because in in, in the culture, she becomes like a symbol of, uh, for example, feminism, which she was not. I mean, she she was not against the feminists, but she was never a suffragette. She never went to demonstrate, etc. But for me, she's like the most feminist possible because she's actually a factual feminist. I mean, she's not into the slogan. To the question, am I equal to a man? Uh, of course, yes. I mean, not only she knows that she's equal, but most of the time she knows that she's br the brightest of all of them. She knows it. And this is not arrogance. If you know that you're better than everybody else and you're better than everybody else, uh, pretending that you are not this good is just false modesty. She just knows she's great and she, she knows it and she behaves you know, adequately with, with what she knows. But then, her modernity is something, but I think also she is with a man, and probably this is why also she chose him. Is he's also extremely modern because imagine end of 19th century, this man he wants a woman who is equal to him, who is a colleague that they can make science together. I mean, even today in 2021, we don't have so many men that they want this kind of thing, you know, from a, from a woman. So you can imagine how it was. So yes. I mean, if, if you see all of that, I always thought that Marie Curie, even for today, she was a woman of the future. She still is. So yes, extremely modern. And Rosamund, one of the things that I kept coming back to as I watched the film was an emotional expression in your portrayal that I felt as an observer was really imbued with ambivalence ambivalence about the role of radium, ambivalence about the incredibly celebrated discovery that could potentially lead to harm, that could potentially lead to damage. And throughout the film, this juxtaposition of future utilizations of this element, future utilizations of this technology that were detrimental, being kind of superimposed on this incredible discovery and also incredible um, uses like like radiotherapy um, or what was what's it actually called in France Curie therapy yes, Curie therapy yes incredible so I'm wondering Rosamond as you were you know portraying her did you see that as an ambivalence how did you embody that that excitement yet I suppose concern about how radium was both the goal and passion of your life, but also something that caused much harm and pain. Um, I think that, you know, during the course of making this film, I thought a lot about the responsibility and cost of a scientist's work, you know, the, the, the the cost involved even in remarkable discoveries and i'm sure that's happening now with the with the scientists who are discovering these vaccines i'm sure you know that while the world is celebrating them i'm sure they have anxieties or concerns that we don't know about i'm sure um there will be doubts there will be fears um and 
you know, one of the jobs of this film, and particularly it wasn't my job, it was actually Marjan's, is to, is to, is to, you know, I can be feeling and thinking inside Marie Curie's brain, but Marjan, and I can let an audience in up to a point, but Marjan also has to find a visual language for how do you, you know, the most exciting parts of science of, is, is the thinking, you know, the thinking that leads to the great discovery. So how do you make thinking visual? And Marjan brilliantly was able to sort of unpack the contents of Marie Curie's brain and put it on the screen, you know. So I think that sequence, particularly after Pierre dies and she's gone into a depression and it's like molecular structures are appearing on her ceiling and the whole room is flooded with radium. And then she sees the streets of Paris and sort of these green droplets are dropping on the floor and big holes are opening up. I mean, that is a sort of representation of fear to my mind. It's, it's grief and, and the hole that he's left, but also, you know, the, the potential repercussions. But, you know, it was an interesting journey with this film because originally in the, in the very first iteration of the script, we saw the dropping of the atom bomb in almost the first five minutes of the film, mm. I think. And what became apparent when we, when Marjan was cutting the film and, and starting to show it to people is that although that is what our film is about, it's a biography of radioactivity, we need as an audience to celebrate her discovery, as you said, you know, for the remarkable thing it was before we taint it with the potential future ill uses. Um, so that was, it, that was an interesting journey, balancing those two things. You're right to see it because it was a balancing act for me and it was a balancing act for Marjan too, all and the way through, right? Yeah. And Marjan, I wonder also thinking about these things through the lenses of Marie Curie, but also through Pierre, these um, concerns or these grapplings with the future. Pierre famously in his, in his Nobel speech spoke about this um, responsibility that the human species has, yet at the same time, he died long before he was able to observe any of the eventualities of the technology. Whereas Marie, through her life, at least saw some of those, um, some of those negative consequences unfold. So I'm interested in how you, as a filmmaker, grappled with kind of the, the different lenses of the characters in the film. No, but as as uh, Rosamund just say, you know, is is a very is a very dangerous game actually to play because you know, of course, you know, because you say uh, somebody discovers some something is that the responsibility of the scientist? Of course not. I mean, she didn't 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 invent something. You know, the radioactivity is something that exists in the nature. So does radium and polonium. These are the elements of the nature. She just discovered it. So is she responsible for all the harm that has been made, you know, from Hiroshima to Chernobyl with all the things that they made, you know, in the desert of Nevada? Obviously not, but, you know, it's a fine line. And it is for people to say, okay, this discovery they are made, me as a human being, uh, in front of the, the, that, which kind of reaction we as a society, as human, we have to have. And that is the ethic of science, which has nothing to do with the scientists. So for me, it was really... I was really, you know, walking on a very thin line, you know, the, like a thin cord, not trying to fall neither on one side or the other, not to celebrate radioactivity, like, yeah, it's the best thing in, in the world, and not to say, oh, no, it's the worst thing in the world, because it's just, the truth is just somebody discovering something. So, yeah, it's it's a very difficult thing, but if we, you come, we come back to the speech of Pierre Curie, he made this speech in 1904, and the atom bomb is, is, is in 1945. It's 41 years after. That means he has the vision. He knows that, you know, that has such a power that, yes, in the hand of criminals, it can be not good. But because there are criminals in this world, we cannot stop advancing because it's, most of the people, they are not criminals. And most of the people, they benefit from the science, then they don't benefit from the science. So. And Marie, yes, to some extent, she saw a little bit of that, you know, like, uh, like you know, the side effects of radioactivity, but even she was not aware. But Rosamund, in her previous interviews, she says something that is so true, you know, at the end, when she goes from all this room to room, you can imagine a brilliant mind like her that explodes, explodes like a radioactive element, can have, you know, can foresee the things. 
And I think the way Rosamund played it is just this knowledge that I'm hurt and I might have foreseen the thing. And I think this is what works yeah. because obviously, you know, it's a big power there and you know also the human being. So yeah, you know, you make one plus one, maybe equal two. Yeah. I think that's why we were justified in this film in flashing forward. I really felt that. I thought, you know, a film has, if a film's going to have flashbacks, it can't just be the, for the convenience of an audience understanding. It has to be because a character is thinking back, right? And the same with flashing forward. And I thought this film is, is, is it, it's validated it's, it, in flashing forward because if any mind is to have a premonition or have an inkling or have a concern, it would be hers, you know? Um, it was very, it was a, it was an amazing thing. Her mind was an amazing thing to try and contain and represent actually. It was a, it was an astonishing thing because she also believed in science and we all, you know, she believed in, in, in furthering and believed that, you know, knowledge has to be, it has to be ultimately good, you know, knowledge, it, it, we're, we're revealing the mysteries of the universe. We're not just, they're not discovering, they're not, they're, they're, they're revealing mysteries that will someday come to light. But um, no, I mean, her mind was remarkable, but we needed to, to also be able to celebrate the joy that it must have been when they discovered radium and isolated it and found that it glowed. You know, if you could dream that the element that you discovered how it would look. I mean, you would pick something totally enchanting, like a glowing green. You know, we've all been enchanted by Tinkerbell in Peter Pan, you know, the light that flashes around. Well, I feel that they had Tinkerbell in a vial, you know, it was something, no wonder, the, and then they called it radium, you know, no wonder the whole world caught on and wanted radium face creams and radium cigarettes and radium watches. And it was just such an intoxicating word, wasn't it? So we have to allow them that moment to you know, beautiful discovery too. <laughs> I absolutely loved the visual representation of radium through all of the things that you mentioned, the kind of vintage packaging of the different products that were on the market, um, the, the dancer and her beautiful gown yeah. and the way that the light reflected across it. And of course, the vial itself that Mary slept with every night. Marjan, was this... Um, was this poetic license or is this something that you that you dug up in doing your research? Did, did Marie Curie yeah, sleep poetic, with radio? In reality, it's poetic license because at one point, you know, I had, I mean, my job was to make the unseenable seenable. You know, you cannot see radioactivity. You cannot see atoms. You cannot see electrons. Basically, actually, you can see electrons if you can make an alcohol chamber and you put a radio radioactive element that is what we see on the on the ceiling you actually can see the trajectory of the of the the, the electrons which is just incredible to to be able to see the trajectory of the, of an electron this easily so it's uh, it was really to find ways you know to 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 show what you cannot show to make the science as exciting that the science is because science is extremely exciting but like any work uh, that demands you know, thinking, it's extremely long. And so it becomes not sexy to show it on the screen. It's like, you have to make it look exciting because it's not like, oh, you know, I'm the private detective and I'm going to go and, you know, catch some rubbers and it's all full, full of action. You're just thinking, redoing the same gesture over and over and over for years, for decades to finally find something. So to make all of that possible, you know, it, it was basically I think it's my job to do it. You know, I have to, you know, put images on the on, on the picture. So yes, you have to find ways to make it look look poetic, but and yeah, before it becomes like too poetic, you know, still it has to be grounded in some kind of reality. And Rosamund is right, you know, radium glows in reality. And all this product is not my invention. Actually, they all existed. I mean, a, at one point, I mean, the humanity believed that radium was actually the answer to everything from, you know, like men who lost, you know, their hair, you know, to how to have a thin waist to, you know, whatever, to glow your face. They, they, they really did believe. And I think one of the ways that the, the science itself was celebrated visually in the film, and one of the things that I so love about this film as a person who has done um, a lot of lab science in my life, 
was the introduction of these vintage experimental apparatuses, the way that you actually didn't just show them in the background, but they were engaged with, they were utilized to show what were the limits of science at the time? What were the tools available? They were made out of, you know, copper and brass. There were, there were no electronics available. We were doing things in a, in a very kind of archaic way, yet look at all of the great discovery that could come from that. So I'm, I'm interested, Rosamond, how did you, um, how did you interact with these, with these tools? What was it like for you to learn how to use them? And, and how much study did you have to do to feel like you looked like you knew what you were doing? Well, I had chemistry lessons before, uh, you know, I, uh, re, re, um, you know, re, uh, relearning my structure of the atom and, 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 and finding also the historical context in which Marie Curie was working, you know, what were um, her paper on crystallization and the, and, or his paper on crystallization and the magnetic properties of steel that she was working on and, and what Becquerel was up to and what was going on. Um, and then that was all in London and, and understanding exactly what radioactivity is that, you know, I had to know, I had to be able to understand what rays were and what the particles were and, you know, what alpha and beta and gamma particles are. And, and then, and then when we got to Prague, um, Marjan had found us a, a, a very passionate, um, if, what was he, he was a professor in, yeah, he was a professor and a historian. <laughs> right. And he was, you know, he assembled all the equipment and, you know, our props department and art department had a tough time with him because he would just, you know, they were so grateful to find anything that looked period. And he would, you know, dismiss some things as completely, you know, not right. And, you know, he and then when it came to doing the crystallization, when when I was, um, you know, scraping away at the salts that she was that she had crystallized, you know, he was, I mean, he would be making these himself. He would not let the art department do it. He was making them himself. He was, he was, uh, you know, discarding any that weren't sort of completely up to scratch. And and I loved the great big flasks and, and exactly how you would, because I needed to know, you know, she can't just be looking. What's she looking for? Is she looking to, is she looking for, um, you know, particles remaining? Is she dissolving? Is she, you know, is she heating? Is she, what, what's she wanting to see? I needed to see that. And these enormous jars, and I had to be able to swill them with my left hand because she was left-handed. Oh, and of course, one of the things that always strikes people is the sheer manual labor of science in, in their day. And that when they got 40 tons of pitch blend, it really was 40 tons of base material that they had to grind down by hand with a great long pole to even have anything that they could work with. Um, and I remember our producer was just obsessed with that. He was like, I love the fact that, you know, I think even although he'd worked on the film for, you know, six years prior to getting into production, it still thrilled him, didn't it? The, the sort of physical passion that, that you have to exhibit, if, you know, the commitment to that discovery. It's a, it's a, it's a, that's why I think it was sort of almost her kind of greatest labor more than her children really, you know, giving birth to radium. You know, she put more blood, sweat and tears into that labor than the labor of her two children. And, and what an astute observation, Marjan. I, I noticed as well that there was almost a, I mean, there was a great love between mother and daughters, but there was almost a, a I don't want to call it a coldness, but it felt a bit removed during the birthing scenes and immediately after. It was, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was. Right. No, there's a curiosity. We went for scientific curiosity about the process rather than, you know, um, starry-eyed wonder. And my favorite was when she was measuring her daughter's heights and then she's like, all right, get over here. Let me measure your head. <laughs> But this, is, but this is true, because when you read her diary, it's not so much about her kids, but then she has a whole notebook where she measures them, like from here to there, the finger, you know, around the head. She, I mean, she has a very mathematical way of loving her kids. And at the same time, you know, it's like, it's okay, you know, that you're not a perfect mother. That's because she was not a perfect mother. That's, but that's okay. I mean, she was a great genius. And so far, you know, her two kids ended up well. I mean, even she ended up, you know, winning the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, 
ever she 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 was a very great pianist she ended up marrying a man who got another Nobel prize so you know i mean they were well educated but you know i don't know i don't i don't think that always being a good mother is making pudding for your kids sometimes showing the example of how to be independent and the spirit of freedom is better than any pudding that you can make for them so you know <laughs> they're not is is a, is a kind of the brain dessert that you serve, serve them, which is just as good. Absolutely. I mean, I the juxtaposition between, as you mentioned, what a beautiful way to put that, Rosamund, that giving birth to radium was really like her largest labor in life. And giving birth to her kids was important, sure. Um, and I think probably her life was fulfilled with her daughters. And you see the tenderness and the love, especially as they become old enough to engage with her intellectually. I think that's when the love and the tenderness really is spelled out in a beautiful way um, in the film, as opposed to when they're young and she's simply serving as a caretaker. I think she's, you, you see it in the scene where she's like, do you, must you be fed? No? Okay, then yeah, get off, you know? Like, they, you know, they had a mother on, experiencing a colossal grief, you know, and mm -hmm. I think they, the girls were sent away, you know, they, they were looked after by their grandparents a lot. I mean, Marie Curie was really debilitated by Pierre's death. I mean, that's for sure. Um, you know, she lost her great collaborator and I'm sure that, you know, the conversation, it was like she was always speaking into a void after that and went away, you know. Um, and the children, that's a, you know, that's a terrible thing. And I don't think, you know, people were obviously much less equipped than we are now uh, psychologically to, to, to sort of help children with grief or understand that children can have all kinds of feelings when a parent dies that are perhaps are needs that are often not being met right? because the parents in their own grief, you know, that the remaining parent is in their own grief. Oh, it was complicated. I mean, she had a very lonely life, you know, and I, that also struck me, the sort of loneliness of science. And I think that's conveyed too in the film in an important way that the responsibility and loneliness of this is, you know, yes, you're celebrated from the outside, but inside, you know, the, the huge thoughts and the huge um, responsibilities, I suppose, that come, and it's quite lonely. And I was also struck with the change in her that occurred because there was a particular loneliness and independence in the early part of the film prior to meeting Pierre, where this was a choice and this was her lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then Pierre sort of wore her down. There was a, a bit of a chase and she was quite resistant. And then ultimately when she decided to let somebody in, there was a vulnerability that she allowed. So then when he was lost later in the film, it was a whole new kind of loneliness, a whole new kind of vulnerability that she almost was trying to avoid throughout her life to that point. And I think that that was portrayed so beautifully. No, because I think one of the reasons in general, Marie Curie or not, one of the reasons that people they are so scared of freedom is that the ultimate price to pay for freedom is to be alone. Uh, when you decide to be very free, you have to pay the high price and it is your loneliness. You cannot be surrounded because then each time you make any decision, you have to make a compromise with everyone. I think she embraced that. And that, that requires lots of force of character and lots of courage. Yeah. And yeah. I think, I think um, freedom, you know, you're right, Rajan. I, I've, you know, that, that, that song, um, Me and Bobby McGee, <laughs> I always think about that song. And, you know, I used to listen to that song when I was younger and think it was this wonderful song about freedom and just sort of being on the open road and being free. And the lyric is, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And now that I'm, now that I'm older and I have family and I have children, I realize that what it means is to get that freedom, you will have, you've got nothing left to lose. Free, freedom has a different meaning if it's just that you've actually burnt everything through and you've lost everything, you know? And I think that's, you know, you're right, at the beginning, she, she was very suspicious of collaboration mm. until Pierre convinced her that, you know, collaboration can be a safe and interesting place to operate in. And after she had opened herself up to it, you know, and had nothing left to lose, she was, she was, she was always lonely. And then she tried to replace it fleetingly with that relationship with Paul Langevin 
but that was a very fleeting, insignificant thing, I think, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, she was, you know, she was a very private person. Marjane discovered, uh, well, I mean, they came to light, these, these parts of her diary that she'd kept after Pierre died. And they are a very, very personal expression of, you know, in the same detail with which she measured her children's heads. Mm -hmm. She described in detail her feelings with his body after he died. And it's completely devastating to read it. It's so personal. You think you must, you should never really be reading it. And that's when we both realized, I think, you know, this is this deeply feeling person, but it, this is the, the deep rivers of feeling that, you know, she doesn't need to show publicly. This is the private, private well of feeling that is to be kept hidden. But as an audience, we can see it because a film allows us private moments with public figures, I suppose. You know, unfortunately, we only have just a few minutes left. So I was hoping that maybe I could ask you what I think might be a good closing question to both of you. Perhaps you can both weigh in. As you were working on this film, and of course, Marjan, um, from the beginning of the research and acquaint, you know, becoming acquainted with these different characters and the story. And, and Rosamond, as you were starting to develop who Mary was in your mind and how you could embody her, I'm wondering how you're different now as, as human beings than you were before you started to do this research and, and engage in the creative process. How have you or your perspectives on the world changed as a result of being involved in this, in this wonderful film? I think the way she, she changed me that she, she made me much more fierce. I mean, if I had any doubts, if anytime I have any doubts, you know, about, uh, should I take these sheets? So that should I, should I, you know, just let it go? And I'm like, what would Marie do? And no, she wouldn't take this shit. So I shouldn't do it. I mean, she did it. She managed to do that 100 years before me. So there is no reason I cannot do it. So yeah, I mean, the little compromises that I would make in life, I don't do them anymore after this film. Yeah, I'm, I'm much more fierce. Yeah, sure thing. I love that. And what about you, Rosamond? Well, I think there are two women who, yeah, I'll, it's a bit emotional now because Marjan, you changed me a lot too. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just Marie, you know, it was the chance, you know, to work with Marjan, who I now count as a friend, but, you know, Marjan has a very unique perspective on life. And, you know, you, you say you've, you've grown in courage. Well, I've always found you courageous because Marjan is one of the very, very few people I know, and it's a quality I really admire, who is, you know, totally upfront and honest and doesn't, you know, doesn't think, doesn't worry that what she says might offend or, or might shock, because life is so much more interesting if you, if you speak what you feel and what you believe. And, 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 and Marie Curie, in the version, in the way that we saw her, was just that kind of woman too. And I think I've got bolder too. That's funny, isn't it? I think I've got bolder through my sort of encounter with both Marie Curie and Marjane. Um, and it's fun. It's a fun place to be. It's definitely way more fun. You know, it's given me, it's given me the courage to call people on stuff. If I see bullshit I'll call it now rather than just sort of complain about it in private I'll call it to someone's face now and that's a way more radical and interesting place to live I can tell you <laughs> so uh so yeah I um oh, Rosa, you made me quiet I, I'm very happy <laughs> so, because sometimes I thought myself like this so thank you <laughs> sometimes you would Sometimes you would. Sometimes I thought of myself like a woman, 
you know, like a scared person. So I'm very happy that it's encouraging me. It, it, it makes me very self-confident. You made me cry. Thank you so much. I, I'm very flattered by what, what you say. Well, it's true. I think, well, I think often life is a dialectic between fear and fearlessness. And I think, you know, we all know that, that risk risk taking leads us on the most exciting journeys however difficult the risk taking can be sometimes but it definitely leads to the most interesting places <laughs> gosh oh big things ladies big questions big things you've asked very interesting questions sarah it's a very different interview from oh, ones we've you. done previously thank you so much you know and i, I Clara, I'm... sorry Clark, <laughs> Clara. No, no, sorry okay. i said Clara. <laughs> That's okay. Because no, I was interviewed by a Sarah earlier today. I'm so sorry. sorry. No, no worries. You know, I, I think that both of your responses to that final question, they really speak to me as an observer as the film. And my assumption is that many women and perhaps, um, you know, everybody across the gender spectrum will get that same kind of feeling within them as they watch the film, this, this strength and this fight that uh, maybe we, we all have inside of us, but we sometimes need to be able to tap into by seeing that behavior modeled by those who we really do respect. And I think that the film has such a great um, power in that. I do very much hope that especially younger women or younger um, gender minority individuals who, who observe this film can tap into that as well and, and find that kind of strength that might, might be lying dormant in them. So I just want to thank the two of you so much for, for all of the incredible work, for, for you know, obviously making this, uh, along with all of your colleagues, for making this film possible and, um, and for, for spending some time with me today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Kara.